Welcome to Harper's Ferry, the election of 1860 secession and war study guide. In 1859, John Brown of leading Kansas fame came up with a plan to arm and free slaves in the South. He planned to raid the military arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Remember, an arsenal is a storage place for guns and ammunition. He gathered a group of 22 men, three of which were his own sons, to join him in this raid. His overall plan? Steal the weapons in the arsenal, head south, gathering up slaves along the way, arming them and having them help him free the rest of the slaves. When Brown and his men got to Harper's Ferry, they tried to make their way to the arsenal. They were spotted and had to kill several men along the way. They left their bodies where they were, and they stopped to cut the communication lines so that no one could communicate outside the city. There had been a celebration going on all day, so most of the townspeople were walking around drunk as skunks, but they did spot the bodies laying on the ground and started firing at Brown and his men. While they were at the train station, a train came in, and Brown and his men held the train hostage for over five hours. When they finally decided to allow the train to leave, the only way that Brown and his men could make it to the arsenal was to take nine of the townspeople hostage. They used the hostages to allow them to get inside the arsenal and keep them safe. Several times, Brown's men tried to escape, but the townspeople shot at them and they were unsuccessful. As soon as the release train reached the next stop, it notified the authorities of what was going on in Harper's Ferry. Brown and his men were forced to stay in the arsenal and risk being killed. While they were stuck there, the military sent in Robert E. Lee to attack and retake the arsenal and arrest John Brown. Once Lee attacked, a battle ensued, killing most of Brown's men, including two of his sons. Brown himself was stabbed and fell unconscious on the ground and was quickly subdued. Several of Brown's men were fortunate enough to run away. One of those was Brown's remaining son. Brown and the rest of the men were arrested and taken to jail to await trial. John Brown's trial lasted for five days. During the trial, he was very well behaved, well spoken, dignified, but he kept saying, the violence was the only way to solve the problem over slavery. Needless to say, he was convicted and he was sentenced to be hanged. Northerners praised John Brown as a martyr to the abolitionist cause. Remember, a martyr is someone who dies for a cause they believe in. And he did do that, and they sort of forgot about the fact that he had killed and murdered people and only concentrated on the fact that he was trying to free the slaves. The Southerners, on the other hand, were outraged and considered him to be a murderer and a traitor. And they were very upset that the North was holding him up as a symbol of abolitionism. A year after John Brown's raid, it was time for the election of 1860. In the election, there were four candidates running for president. Abraham Lincoln was the Republican candidate. He had become a well-known name throughout America with the Lincoln-Douglas debates and was, of course, the obvious candidate to run for the Republican Party at this time. It was a bit of a rematch as Stephen Douglas also ran for president, only he ran for the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party had split over the idea of compromise on the slavery issue. Stephen Douglas represented the existing Democratic Party. John Breckinridge represented the new Southern Democratic Party, primarily made up of the states in the Deep South that would be the hurt the most if they got rid of slavery. John Bell was the candidate for the Whig Party. We all know the results. Abraham Lincoln won the election and became the 16th President of the United States. The South considered Lincoln's election, along with an abolitionist-controlled House and Senate, to be the signal for the end of their way of life. Therefore, their only choice was to secede from the Union and make their own country. In December of 1860, South Carolina was the first state to secede and leave the Union. They were followed by six other states within the next six months, and by February of 1861, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas had all seceded from the Union. Delegates from these seven states met in Montgomery, Alabama and formed a new country called the Confederate States of America, and they chose to elect Jefferson Davis to serve as their president. 
They set up a government similar to the Articles of Confederation, where the majority of the power remained with the states. Lincoln did not believe the states had the right to secede from the Union, but he did try to avoid war. Southerners used the Declaration of Independence to justify their secession. They used the section of the Declaration that stated the purpose of a government was to protect people's natural rights, and when a government becomes destructive of that purpose, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish that government and replace it with a new government. Once their government was in place, the Confederacy started to claim all military forts in the seceded states. Jefferson Davis sent out the word to take all of those forts, and they tried to chase out as many of the Northerners from the South as they could. Lincoln couldn't allow the South to just take the forts, but he knew if he used force, the remaining eight Southern states might choose to secede, and that would mean war. Fort Sumter, South Carolina was one of the remaining Union forts in the South. They were running low on supplies. As a matter of fact, Lincoln received a supply request from Robert Anderson, the commander of the fort, the day after he was sworn in as president, and he tried to send supplies to resupply the fort. Lincoln sent word to Governor Pickens of South Carolina, telling him that he would be sending a shipload of supplies to the fort, hoping that Pickens would let these supplies reach the fort. Unfortunately, supplies never made it. On April 12th of 1861, Confederate General Beauregard asked Union General Anderson to surrender Fort Sumter. It was very difficult for him because Anderson had been his instructor at West Point and responsible for giving him the recommendation that allowed him to remain at West Point. So he had a lot of respect for Anderson and he really didn't want to have to go to war with him. Respectfully, Anderson refused to surrender the fort. A short while later, the Confederate troops opened fire. The cannon fire went on all night long. Eventually, the entire interior of the fort, anything made out of lumber, was on fire. At one point, one of the cannonballs struck the American flag, knocking it to the ground, and several of the Union soldiers risked their lives to pick up the flag, build a new flagpole, and re-raise it over the fort. They were worried that the fire would reach the few remaining casks of gunpowder that they had. They saw the supply ships out in the bay. They were disappointed that no one came to assist them. And Anderson was forced to surrender the fort after 34 hours of shelling by the Confederate soldiers. This fort was surrendered on April 13, 1861, without a single loss of life. Ironically, Part of the surrender agreement was that the Union soldiers could fire a hundred cannon salute as they were leaving and surrendering the fort. After about the 50th cannon shot, one of the cannons backfired and exploded, killing one of the artillerists and injuring three other Union soldiers, one of those mortally. So the two deaths that occurred in the battle for Fort Sumter occurred after the surrender was agreed upon. The Civil War had now begun. And now you know a little bit about John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, the election of 1860, secession, and the very first shots fired in the Civil War.